is Chairman Emeritus of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Board, Mrs. Mary Fendrick Hallman. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. are started on the straightaway at Indianapolis. The crews with one final check. On board camera of Robbie and Gordon's car. Let's go down. Line. Gary Jerry Punch. AJ Foyt, what advice? As it accelerates. Alan Sir Jr. controls the field. A very slow pace at this point. In a few seconds, it will quicken. We hope for a fast start. We pray for a safe start here at Indianapolis. Paul, I think he's bringing it down slow to get that pace car out of the way, and then he'll gradually build up as they are now. The crowd is going crazy. They're picking up the pace. Little Al picks up the pace. Raul Boisel drops back just a bit as the field flows toward the green flag now off the fourth and final corner. Dwayne Sweeney has the flag, and the green flag is out. Oh, look at that start. He gave him the green just as they passed under. Bobby, I couldn't believe that start. They were totally out of out of line. I could not believe that he gave that as a green start. Danny Usak was considering stop, but then he decided maybe it was halfway decent. They decided two cars were up. Well, Fell didn't just keep up. But as they went through turn two, everybody was smooth and in good shape. Well, and Bozell's dropped back to about six spot. He really got pinched in at the start. I'm sure he's fired up. Al Unser Jr., the first pool sitter to lead the first lap since Rick Mears in 1991. Little Al is in front. He is chased by his teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi. Michael Andretti has moved up and picked up the third position. Then Ari Leyendijk. Then Mario Andretti and Eddie Cheever. They're on the back stretch. This is the Mercedes power that we talked about. They were able to just jump the start and pull away. I reckon they've throttled back a little bit now. No reason to show all their cards right away here in the race. Well, all right, let's take a look. We'll see it. Watching for the red car, Vitolo, and there it is. Quick spin and back pointed straight. That's enough to bring out the yellow. Here's another angle of it. Oh, oh. beautiful spin. That's a Danny Sullivan style spin, but by a man with much less experience. Dennis Vitolo, a rookie who put all his life savings into this race and nearly had him wiped out there. Well, Sam, he was very, very lucky. It's very seldom that somebody could spin and keep going that good. Bobby, one of the things that I noticed in watching this tape is he was really trying to pinch the car down very low. His skid started back a little ways, but very low on the track. And Teo Fabi had a real scare when Vitolo spun in front of him. There's Dennis's wife, Corinne. But he is the wall, our second yellow of the day. Yeah, and I can see the car right from where I am, Paul, although I didn't see all the spin. I saw the end of it, and the car isn't really hurt all that bad. It wasn't that bad a wreck. He's sitting still in the car. He's moving now. He's going to be able to get out, so I'm sure he's in pretty good shape. With 20 laps complete, Robbie Gordon had moved up through the field and then the yellow light came on. And there is the sign at the pits. Now here's the rule here. The field must bunch behind the pace car before they open the pits. There's Roberto Guerrero's spin, Sam. Well, the terrific thing is we've now had two spins, if you include the Dennis Fitolo one, and nobody hurt. And I think that the configuration of the track as of last year, with the aprons pay, uh, grassed over, it's terrific because the spins keep you away from the wall now. There he is in the center of the screen in the green car, losing it really low on the track, uh, Danny, just the same way Vitolo did. Let's take a look at that first replay once again. We'll do it in slow motion now. Roberto Guerrero. He came off the turn too low, Paul. He was pinching it coming off the turn. And you can see he's going right across the short chute, sliding across, really slowed down the speed a lot. Comes out and bangs the car really very gently. Bobby, do you think that that is partly because of the uh, understeer that they're all experiencing? 
Yes, what happens is they're pinching it too much coming off. A lot of the guys have been doing this down in turn two. I saw Lynn St. James almost spin just a little bit ago. Turn one. Looks like one of the Dobson's cars, the Pac West machines. Other car down against the wall is difficult. Bobby Unzer, do you have glasses on this? One car comes very slowly through this, and Paul, all of the equipment is there. There's so much equipment around it, Paul, I really can't see it. And we saw the end of it, but we couldn't see the start of it from here. And one of the cars appears to be Dominic Thompson. That's the right one down on the inside. We'll take a look at some replays, see if we can tell what happened. There's Dobson pinched down tight on the inside. We know he's one of the cars involved. Now remember, one of the problems when you see an accident like this isn't just the two cars that are in the accident, it's all the parts that are flying. The drivers behind are trying to miss all those pieces. They don't know at that speed whether it's big pieces of the car or a race car or little pieces. Well, and also, Bobby, the big thing with those cars behind them is trying to gently go on the brakes, not too hard, so that they don't spin and get involved in the accident. There it is again. Mike Groff is the other car. Mike Groff, the other car. Look at that from the apex cam. We'll take a look at one more angle. Now this is a problem. You can watch. Yeah, you can watch that what happened there is, is two guys tried to get in the same position. Two cars just joined, and the car on the inside really couldn't do much about it. The guy on the outside that comes down, the guy on the inside, they can't do much. There's a right rear tire on the 40 car. Look at that. Scott, Scott Goodyear. Scott Goodyear, who started 33rd, and he's in trouble. Hopefully that rubber will not beat any damage into the back of the car, but it looks like it already has. So we're under yellow again here at Indianapolis with 30 laps complete. You're watching Sky Sport. Back at Indianapolis, they try to get the cars off of the race course at the 17 car of Dominic Dobson. The crews here from the United States Auto Club have very carefully extricated Dominic Dobson from the car. He is on the stretcher. Now let's take a look at this situation from the teammate of Mike Groff, Bobby Rahal. Danny Sullivan, what's happening here? Well, of course, the accident's occurred in front of him. He's trying to slow. He looks at all the debris. The car's slowing. Makes a great move across the grass onto the lane and safely out of there. Here's another view of the same thing. Bobby Unzer. Yes, and you can see Groff coming down. He wants to go to the bottom. Now, he just went a little too far. Watch the right front and the left rear. Groff's left rear caught. It spins him. Pinch the front end of the car on the left and watch Groff. He goes and he hits the wall backwards. This is where he's been hurt. That's very solid on these cars. They don't give as much on the back as they do the front, Paul. You know, and it sounded like Bobby Rahal's now car watch, took a hit of something now heavy. Now watch Rahal coming around, and you see it's that tire. If you hit a tire, you might as well hit a car. That's what everybody's trying to miss. Tires are floating around there just like pebbles. So debris everywhere down in the first turn as the ambulance now heads back to the uh, track medical facility. In the pits, they've been working on Lynn St. James' car and Mario Andretti's car. Let's go to the pits and Gary Punch. Well, Mark Moore is Dominic Dobson's chief mechanic. And Mark, what did Dominic say happened out there? Um, he was going down into turn one, and maybe you guys can see it on the replays. He got all the way inside uh, Mr. Groff, and Groff came down on him, probably didn't see him. I've seen seen him work with Mike Groff a lot of years, and I know he didn't mean to do it. He's not that kind of guy, but Dominic was running really well. We changed the right front wing. He had a good push for a while and was making a good restart, and the car felt better. He's gotten out of the car now, and his legs hurt a bit, but uh, he's okay. Yeah, but what happened was that Bozell was slowed going into the corner, and... That's 230 miles an hour. They almost touching. And we Gordon had nowhere to go, Bobby, because there was a car to his right. That's he why was, it was so close. Sam, he was really worried about it. The wall on the right, Bozell on the left. Close. There is some debris up on the track. Masuda. 
Adesi Masuda, the first rookie to qualify, first car to go out in qualification. I just happened to be looking up, Paul, at the track. Is this happened? It looked like he just lost the rear end coming off. Spun, hit the wall. Doesn't look like it was all that bad. Blue, the blimp spirit overhead with that shot. There's the replay. Lost it coming off at turn one, slammed the wall, and then just slid down to the inside. But again, look at all that trash that flies off the track around there. We got to watch for flat tires from the other cars. That's the biggest fear that they have. Bobby, how much trash is down in that area as we look at another replay of this accident? Really doesn't look that bad. Guys, sorry to interrupt carpet. you. We got another one up here in turn three. We have another accident in turn three. This is an accident after the yellow? Yes, they're down here. It might have been that debris that we're talking about. He might have lost a tire. And that's John Paul Jr. There's a flat tire that you can see, most likely. That doesn't mean it was caused by the debris, but, but uh, Danny's probably right. They run over debris, they have a flat tire to go in the next turn, and wow, we the car just takes off. Well, Bobby, that's exactly why I ask you, because it's, and look uh -oh. at this. Paul Tracy. Smoke Paul out of Tracy. the Mercedes of Paul Tracy. Now, Tracy was back in 13th place. He was not probably positioned to win the race, but this could be the first weakness shown by the Mercedes program. All right, let's go back. We'll keep track of Tracy. Here is the car 45, the John Paul situation. Boy, lost it way early. That almost uh, definitely confirms that Danny saw. What's this? What's this? There's Mansell. Nigel Mansell under, unbelievable. Nigel Mansell and Great. Dennis Vitolo. Why? How did they get to this point? An unbelievable After the situation. Yellow. What is going on? The yellow no. light's been on for several laps. That yes, is on the pit road. That's but interesting that Mansell and I think Al Jr. were the first guys through were the first guys through the uh, accident. Maybe they picked up a puncture too. Yeah. Nigel, Nigel Mansell decides to get out because there was fire on the back of the car. And, and remember, this is methanol that's burning, and you can't see it. Sam, that's, that's uh, oil that's burning right there, not methanol, and you could see it. It's right underneath the engine there. Yeah, but what about Mansell? One of the firemen saw something and I went to just totally envelop Mansell. Maybe he thought that Mansell was on fire or saw some of those flames that we can't see from methanol. Bobby, I saw the oil fire, but then so suddenly Mansell seemed to leap forward as if something else. That's why I suppose that maybe the methanol had ignited. That's because everybody is screaming fire. He wasn't in a hurry until everybody starts screaming. And he also knows the methanol fires are almost invisible, Sam. Well, but yep. Bobby, he is on the ground. Bobby, it's it not an easy climb been, out. It could have been, too, if his radiator was punctured. Don't forget that'll take time until it seeps into the back of the cockpit, and he could have all of a sudden got the hot water. Which feels through. like fire, right? Exactly. Yeah. And maybe burns worse. It's not very often we see one car on top of the other. This is really a terrible looking possible accident there. On the warm up lane, and we first. still have no idea how these two cars, Vitolo and Mansell, got there well after the yellow. Let's get an update from Gary in the Mansell pit. I'll tell you, Paul, this team is devastated down here because they were elated when that initial yellow came out. They were going back on the lead lap. They were right back in the race. Then suddenly, Linkley after the yellow, here's the problem for Mansell. They have ridden the roller coaster right to the bottom of the pit right now. Well, Gary, remember, the Newman Haas team has never managed to win Indy, and they've been competitive year after year since they started in 1993, 83. I'm worried about Nigel Mansell. He is in great discomfort there. Nigel and Jacques Villeneuve were both about to make up a lap, taking advantage of the yellow that came out. And then this happened, and we still don't have a clear understanding of why it happened. I think, obviously, Paul, that he got hurt in the accident. He was just sitting there for a while, hoping that somebody would come helping out, help him out, and then he either felt that hot water that Danny was talking about, or somebody was hollering fire, but he got out, no matter how much pain he had. Bobby, your heart just goes out to Nigel, who's been hurt so often in racing, one way or another. That bad accident at Phoenix last year, which he bravely overcame to finish third here in this race, and now this. Well, let's take a look at Nigel Mansell's in-car. Maybe that'll give us an idea of what happened here. The yellow light is on. Emergency equipment is on the track. First time we're all seeing it. This is turn one. And he's suddenly hit. And we're waiting. That was the camera going out. There's the nothing camera wrong with the set. stopped. We're still watching the tape because 
There is where the camera comes back. And he gets hit from behind. That's what it looks like. We'll still ride with this videotape from Nigel Mansell's camera. Mansell's still sitting over. there. Go ahead, Danny. His head's laid over a little bit to the left. I don't understand that. Yeah, could he was be dazed? Here's the smoke. Fire starting in the back of the car. That's the oil smoke. It's from Dennis Bartolo's car, though, I believe. There's a little oil dripping down. You could see that. That's why it was burning with a yellow flame. Nigel takes off the steering wheel so that he can get out. Now he's slow. And See, I think the water or something came through there, and all of a sudden he realized he was getting burned. There's See, the water. Out, the water's spitting out. That's from the radiator, I believe, of either his car or somebody else's. Also it's from the fire extinguishers. Here is Michael Andretti's onboard camera. Maybe we can get a view from this camera, the same situation. No, that's really John Paul Jr. Was John Paul Jr. the first spin under the yellow? Now that's one that you would just have to see. That was a tire puncture because the car just went out of control immediately. Yeah, the because driver's he, fault. Because the amazing part, Bobby, is that nobody's really going fast. I've never seen so many accidents, severe accidents, under a yellow. Danny, you it's like remember the rear end is one solid axle from right to left. If you have a tire goes flat, the other one keeps driving the car. There's the other accident right there. All right, let's review what's happened here at Indianapolis. Masuda had an accident. They turned on the yellow light. Apparently, John Paul Jr. drove through the debris of the accident, and straight away later, he had an accident. And then during that yellow, Nigel Mansell was hit from behind by Dennis Vitolo, or apparently hit from behind. So we are still under yellow here at Indianapolis as we approach the halfway point, our 100 laps of the Indianapolis 500 with Mercedes-Benz 1 and 2. You're watching four feet long. It's cruising over the speedway at 30 miles an hour. Let's go down to the track once again. Gary Gerald. Well, Paul Tracy has just climbed out of his Mercedes Benz Ilmore, and uh, I know this is a huge disappointment, and you had to chase some early problems. Get it out there in the middle of the lane, and I stalled it, and then we couldn't get it started, and it, that put us back, so we're just chipping away, moving up, moving up, moving up, and then we... uh it happened. He's got to be ahead, and that's the way it turned out. As we suggested, within the last 20 laps, the last 50 miles, and Emerson Fittipaldi brushes the wall on lap 184. You should hear the crowd. Down here in turn two, everybody is standing up, literally every person. The same in turn four. Of course, it happened right here in turn four. I couldn't believe it. He just got a little bit loose. Let's watch it. Oh, boy. They had the race locked up. The rear end just jumped right out from under. He had to correct it right into the wall. Danny, you were watching it. I was sitting there watching that. I'm not so sure the air wasn't disturbed. I think he wanted to make a run a little bit at Little Alley. He looked like he wanted to go back and try to pass it, and he just lost it. So Emerson Fittipaldi is out. One more replay for you. You know, I have to, I have to say that there's a real, real good chance that he had a sudden puncture in the right rear. You watch that car. It didn't let loose gradually. It let loose just really quick. Really quick. And you know, Bobby, his angle didn't look bad. It didn't look like he got down on the apron or anything. It just looked Absolutely like not. Danny, all of a sudden went, he, went, went wrong. I think he really had a puncture in the tire. Something that happened really quick because you could watch him feeding that front end to it. So he obviously felt something very sudden. The sixth yellow of the day for the leader of the race. In that instant, Emerson Fittipaldi's million dollars and third Indy win go out the window. There's Fittipaldi. He walks back now after lap after lap at 200 miles an hour. Teresa already heading back toward the garage area. She's only worried about her husband. Ari Leyendijk pulls to the inside. He's apparently out of the race. Indication is the motor's gone on Leyendijk's car. He started with three. Now Penske is left just with Al Unser Jr., but he's left with the leader of the race. 
So little Al, alone on his lap now. With 15 laps to go. And keep in mind now, now strategies have changed. The yellow has happened. We're gonna have to get on top of that real quick. Bobby and Danny, let's consider now the situation we're gonna, we're gonna watch in very slow motion first. One more replay of Fittipaldi's situation. Danny, you were right above it. Yes, I was looking at I did not see anything wrong, but then I just saw the back end of the car start to slide. You can see there Emerson corrects it. The front turns. He lets it go a little bit, and the back goes. I agree with Bobby. I'm not so sure that something wasn't wrong there. That was very uncharacteristic. Emerson's too experienced to make a mistake this late in the race while leading. Another shot of it. The moment that may have decided the 78th Indianapolis 500. Chasing Al Unser Jr., but leading the race. You know, another real slight possibility, Paul, is when we watch it down here in turn two on the television, it looks like maybe some fluid was spraying out underneath the back end. I'm not saying for sure, but it looks like a possibility to me. Well, Bobby, let's explore that further. You're saying fluid out of the back end of Emerson Fittipaldi's car. Does that then yes. mean that... We are also looking at a potential Mercedes engine problem? No, not, not true at all. There was no engine explosions blowing or anything like that. Could be a radiator, could be a hose that that show if that was the case. Here's Jack down in the Penske pits. Well, Paul, we continue to have radio problems. We're going to try and get the camera so you can see Roger Penske has grabbed literally an old blackboard. He wants to find out if fuel is okay. He has relayed that by one blackboard to the blackboard man directly across his pit, and he is going to single, signal that to Al Unser Jr. Yeah, but Jack, is that message that it is okay, or is he asking, is it okay? Well, we're being moved out of the pit here. We've got some uh, people that are moving us out. I'll try and find out from oh, Rick that Mears. that means that it is okay. It the means that it is okay. That's what they're telling he little Al. The the Al does not have to him on this. So he has to go by the yellow lights on the track. Yeah, but don't forget now, it looks like this race will probably end under a yellow because I don't see him getting that cleaned up with just a couple laps to go, and he's going to be very conservative here. I don't know, Danny. Sometimes these crews will get that debris off real quickly. Let allow motors through. Look how slow he came through there, Paul. He Boy. was really, really looking for debris on the car. And Big Al can barely stand it. But Penske is concerned. Does this give a chance for Vilnep to close up again? Well, he was losing ground, so I don't believe that he'll have moved up any cars. The incident, of course, is Stan Fox. We may not have mentioned that to you. Stan Watching Fox was out. racing in the top 10, Paul. It's a real shame for him. He's done so well all month and has soldiered through the race. So Stan Fox against the wall, bringing out the yellow. 197 laps complete, Jerry Punch. Emerson Fittipaldi just walking out of the care center. First of all, MR, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I mean, uh, that was a shame the car was flying. And I just hit the apron, uh, but I would say about the feet too much on the inside. I got that. I made the back end lost. I nearly correct, and then I, I hit the wall coming out. It was a shame, but I 